the Battle Hymn of Republic. That is the song of the day, every Memorial Day. And you know, over the last few years, I've gone away from saying Happy Memorial Day and saying Have a Blessed Memorial Day because, and I'm sure my next guest would agree, um, saying happy doesn't really make sense when we're honoring those who lost their lives for us. And actually, someone who was a participant in the uh, Cedarhurst, uh, remind me again, Bill Stanford's on the line with me, by the way. Bill and I go way back just a few months ago, actually, um, to AM 970 The Answer Days. And he is a, a veteran himself. And I know you were marching in the Memorial Day Parade yesterday. So tell us about that. And thanks for coming on my platform uh, today for Memorial Day. Oh, well, sure, Alex. And uh, thank you for having me. Yes, yesterday I, I participated in, in the Memorial Day Parade in Lawrence and Cedarhurst in the five towns of Long Island. And I was joined by my neighbor, uh, who was also a, a veteran. And I, it was a great time. It, it's great to get out there and, and celebrate our fallen heroes, right? So this is not uh, this is not a day of celebration for myself. And, and I was honored to be asked to participate in the parade, but this is a, a day to commemorate those have, that have fallen in service to our nation. Bill Staniford, you are actually in the Marines, you're a cryptologist, I mean, you even were running for Congress for a little bit there. Uh, so was this parade a little different knowing, you know, that you've had all this stuff going on? Was this year a little different because of what's going on in the country? I feel like our fabric's being ripped away after Evaldi, after everything's going on. There's really no unity. So do you think this weekend could be the final unifier we need? Well, I don't think there's going to be a final unifier at all. I think I think that we are, uh, the country itself is entrenched in, in a, uh, you know, um, a cultural war. And I, I don't see that changing at any point in time. But that being said, uh, there were quite a few people out yesterday attending the Memorial Day Parade, and that was great to see that people are still interested in in honoring our fallen heroes. Because that's what it comes down to, right? I feel like it comes down to the community now honoring each and every veteran they have, it, because the nation as a whole won't do it. It's up to the communities now. Absolutely, and I, I think that's fine. I, and I do, again, all, all politics is local. So it is, it's important to participate in your community locally, and I was proud to have done that. And again, so Memorial Day is, <clears throat> is special to me because I have an uncle who died in World War II, and he was, he was incredibly young, 18 years old, and died in France right on, right on the border of Germany fighting the Nazis. So... This is uh, you know, it's a, it's a very important day to me, and it's uh, it's in very it's very important for me to remember my uncle Jack Thompson. Well, and I don't want to get totally political, but when you have an R next to your name when you're running for Congress, I feel like people don't want to hear that story. So I'm glad that you told that because I feel like they just want to shut anybody out who who doesn't agree with them. That's why Memorial Day is so unique because it still brings people together from the left and the right. I, I would hope so, anyway. Yeah, listen, I, I think that the majority of Democrats, or at least sane Democrats, uh, do honor the, the heroes that have fallen in in service to our nation. I, I do think that. And and again, I mean, you and I have had this conversation many times. I believe that the Democratic Party is split, It's and the numbers bear it out. It's split pretty dramatically between the capitalists and the socialists. And that's a big divide. That's not a small divide. And... You know, people that are that that consider themselves Democrats have to ask themselves the question: Am I a capitalist or am I a socialist? And if mm. if you fall on the side of socialism, then you carry along the baggage of hundreds and hundreds of murders throughout uh, generations. All right, Bill. I, I've kind of had this theme all weekend long about honoring each other because isn't that what the troops? fought for is to, for all of us to honor each other. It might sound pie in the sky, but I just feel like that's what they fought for to defend the country and to defend our unity. And they'd want us to be better toward each other. That's why they fought for us. Yeah. I, I don't know if I agree with that, Alex. Um, I, <clears throat> I, well, I, you know, again, I, I'm a veteran. I joined during wartime, right? So I joined 
when the the, the guns were uh, were firing. And the reason why I joined was not for some high ideal of that unification or anything of that. Uh, I joined. I join for the people in this country to experience freedom, and and I still think that's the most important piece when it comes to politics. I that that's why I'm such a strong advocate for states' rights and state control. And let's take the power away from the federal government. Let's bring it down to the state. And there's nothing wrong with having states that have different cultures, right? There's a there's a wonderful reason, and I've lived in many different states. I went to school at, the, in, at Texas, and, and I was raised in New York. And these two states couldn't be more different, and that's great. That is actually wonderful to, for the fabric of the country, in my estimation. You know, those who listen to you on AM 970, The Answer, still might listen to this podcast. So tell us what you've been up to since um, April, actually. Well, so, so I've been, I pivoted obviously right back into the private sector and I am working on some, some very exciting projects in, in real estate technology. And I, I'm not, I'm not ready to come out and announce exactly what I'm working on, but it, I do consider it has the potential to be revolutionary in the real estate industry and focused again on data, which is my area of expertise and it's an area that I think that there is almost unlimited potential uh, for the future. So, you know, I'm very excited about getting back and, and working, doing things that are meaningful. Um, but I certainly haven't closed the door on politics. Mm -hmm. I am focused now on, on trying to generate as much capital as possible. And, and I will be looking to, to run again sometime in the future. All right, Bill, you mentioned real estate just a minute ago, and I've had this theme also that, you know, the homeless crisis for veterans. What Do you have any thoughts on that? Because is the media right on the money that it's bad? Is there hope for veterans that, that are homeless right now? Like, what what are you seeing on the ground? Well, homelessness is a, is a big problem. And I would say that the number one problem or number one cause of homelessness, if you will, is substance abuse. And so I think that any type of strategy that is is looking to take on, first of all, we can't accept people living on the street. That that seems like we're not a we're, we're not a sane society if we accept that it's it's tolerable for people to live on the street. So I, I do think that one of the one of the big problems in our country in general is that we have become too tolerant. Mm -hmm. And it, that sounds interesting, but it, it's something I truly believe. I think that we've become a bit too tolerant and we start, we have to, we have to understand that some people are, are not looking out for the best interests of themselves or others. And we have to get them off the street. So, um, you know, again, anyone that's interested in participating, uh, to try to come up with solutions for homelessness really needs to look into my favorite organization, which is the Doe Fund, and it, it's active here in New York City. And again, what makes the Doe Fund really different is that if, you, if you're if you homeless and you want to stay in the Doe Fund, you have to be clean and sober to stay there, which I think is, which is the critical element for you to get back on your feet. All right. And I've, I've heard a lot about the Doe Fund, and it's a good work for sure. Um you're also an entrepreneur. You're a veteran and entrepreneur. And another thing the media doesn't talk about is that veterans are, you know, when they come back, they find a way to make a life for themselves and do start businesses. I mean, I'm sure you work with other veterans as well. Are you seeing a rise in entrepreneurship in the veteran community? Not really. It's it's actually, it's quite difficult for, for, on, for servicemen to transition back into the private sector. And that is certainly something that I'm interested in, in helping with. I, I actually believe that I can, my insights can, can really help uh, bring veterans back into the, the private sector and, and get them gainful employment and make them feel useful and helpful. And I, I understand obviously very intimately what the skill sets they have, um, they have, they are bringing to the, to the workplace 
and I'm I'm looking forward to to working on that project um, on into the future as well. And please keep us posted on that because I always, I, you know, I feel like society as a whole doesn't mention the vets after Memorial Day, July the fourth, or Veterans Day, but it really is a continuing conversation beyond these three big days, isn't it? Oh sure. Listen, a lot of it is actual work, right? So, I, you know, I call on all companies to make it a point that if, if you don't have at least one veteran in your organization, get one, right? I mean, they say it's not that hard. Uh, you know, I, I'm certainly going to be trying to hire more than one when I when I work on my project going forward. I'm, I'm going to try to make it a point to hire as many as I can, but I think any organization – um, it is beneficial for them to find at least one spot for one veteran um, somewhere. And, you know, there's the, uh, the people that serve this country are total less than 1% of the population. So it's mm-hmm. very important that you, you understand who the vets are, you understand what skill sets they bring, because they certainly do bring skill sets to almost every industry. And it's important that employers you know, make it a point to to hire at least one vet in their organization. And that would improve the mental health if these veterans started working, wouldn't it? I, I, I think that might be an issue. I, most, most vets are fine, right? <clears throat> most vets don't have any mental health issues. Um, and, you know, it's only a very small minority of, of vets that, that do have mental health issues. And, um, you know, th- there are certainly resources available for them to, to get help for their uh, their health related issues, but for the most part, all vets are are just uh, hardworking, diligent individuals that don't have <clears throat> this concrete private uh, work experience, and and uh, it, it's something that I think all employers should just become a bit more knowledgeable. I've never asked you this because I don't know, um, but did you ever lose anyone in your company? When you were in the military, did you see loss on the battlefield? I, I didn't. And, <clears throat> but then again, you know, I, I personally served in intelligence, so I was not on the front lines in any way, shape, or form. And also, I, I did say just now that I joined during wartime, which is accurate. By the time I got out of boot camp, the war was over. So, um, you know, that was the first Gulf War, which was quite short. But, you know, to answer your question directly, I didn't have any, you know, close friends that that died in combat. Well, then, I mean, I I think that makes up someone as well when they come back, seeing someone die in the battlefield. It's horrifying. And we I don't know. We don't talk enough about that at times. But, you know, you did have some trauma in your military and in your world. And I don't know if you want to bring on this podcast, but the idea that you were spied on. And I know that the Russia, Ukraine war uh really triggered that for you over the last few months well i mean that's it so <clears throat> that's a somewhat of an understatement actually so I, I was tracked by the russian government for approximately 18 years um with three unique individuals and spanning the the entire time that i during i the time that i was in the military to the time that I was going to college at the University of Texas, to the time that I was in the private sector and serving as the CEO of Property Shark in New York City, um, that, it, you know, getting targeted by a foreign adversary, it's, it's hard to imagine um, the type of things that go on in your head after you realize the extent uh, uh, of that espionage. But yeah, that was, uh, that was a pretty traumatic experience for myself, and, um, and I'm, I'm happy that uh, all of those uh, spies, all 10 of those spies were, were captured. And, uh, and, you know, it was like the military, you know, it was like your battlefield was still having to report to your higher-ups about it, wasn't it? Well, you know, I did I did work with the FBI to ensure the the arrest of, of these uh, these spies. And, you know, ultimately, it, it's, it's pretty terrifying to know that a foreign adversary is, has been... Um, following you for an 18-year period of time, that's pretty terrifying. But once they were arrested, um, I felt pretty good about the entire situation, and I'm, I'm certainly glad that um, we were able to arrest them. Well, and you think about it, in the 16 campaign, the FBI was targeting George Papadopoulos. They didn't really work with him, and it feels like the opposite happened with him. But his story resonates when I hear what you're talking about, because he was 
you know, talking with people in London or whatever, but he wasn't given the chance to turn them in. He was turned on, actually. No, and and I the whole the whole Russian spy scandal does make me quite angry because to me, um, it's very obvious what happened. And you know, the first thing I'll say is that the, the Russian spy apparatus isn't that professional. These people are very much human, fallible, um, and for them to take on a, a, a mission of this magnitude is somewhat beyond their skill set, is, sure. is what I would say. And look and, at that. That's translating on the battlefield, too, because Russia's losing, you know, military members left and right in Ukraine, it sounds like. Sure. I mean, that, that, that's absolutely the case. But but let's get real. The, you know, the, the, the espionage or, or the, the activity of Russia during the, the 2016 election began during the primaries against Hillary Clinton. That's a fact. And everybody remembers that the primary candidate against Hillary Clinton was none other than Bernie Sanders, the open socialist who had vacationed and honeymoons in Moscow. And, and they were supportive of Bernie Sanders, okay? Like, this is the thing that drives me absolutely crazy. Why would the Russians support, like, the the most iconic capitalist over someone who's an, an overt socialist? And, you know, that, that angle just never gets brought up, and it's, it's ridiculous. Well, and uh, it's, no, I, I hear you there. I, I was going to ask you, though, um, we were talking about the Russia-Ukraine for a while and how those soldiers were actually given sympathy for not knowing what they were getting into. And I'm thinking to myself, we, I said it in the studio, Bill, why didn't the American soldiers get that kind of uh, sympathy or that kind of, we're hated on uh, in America. Troops are sometimes hated on, and I think that's wrong. Sure. But again, I mean, if you, if you want to figure out who are criticizing whom, all you have to figure out is who are the capitalists and who are the socialists, Right. So if, if you're a socialist, you're going to be criticizing the U.S. and the U.S. troops, right? That's it. And, and like, again, it, you really don't have to look for it. The biggest driver in politics right now is socialism. And that's the, that's the main issue that people like myself are fighting against. I, that's why I'm a Republican. This is why I'm standing up for the Democrat Party, because they're aiding and abetting socialism. Period. Bill, I'm going to attach our conversation uh, from AM97 The Answer because I feel like we're having the same kind of rapport now. It's awesome. Um, and that was a whole hour long conversation, which you can hear in the comment section of this podcast or description of this podcast. But I also know you're into crypto and I feel like it is going toward crypto good for not only us, but for military members. I mean, it, what you're working on with the crypto world could impact all of us, veterans or not. Absolutely. And, and I, I mean, first of all, the crypto space has really targeted the financial industry. Well, there's a, there's a couple of different industries that, that the crypto space and, and let's, let's get, let's get accurate. The blockchain space, right? Okay, so yes. blockchain technology is the technology that I'm interested in and all cryptocurrency works with blockchain technology but not all blockchain technology is cryptocurrency. Okay, so let we get that get that clear. And then when you're talking about blockchain technology, which is which is really accounting software when you boil it down to its essence, and the account it, it's really targeted at the financial industry. And this is what gets me so excited. And I, and I, I I have to say that everybody everybody. Anybody that's listening to this, you, you have to start getting educated on blockchain technology and what it can actually do and how you can participate. Because you know, right now, um, I am I'm I'm acting as in a way I'm acting as a bank myself, and and any individual can participate with funds um, to contribute to what's called decentralized finance. And eventually, we're talking about the disintermediation of the banks. And when we talk about the banking industry, you can understand why this is so necessary. 
because for whatever reason, right, the banking industry is the most regulated industry in the country, right? That, that almost goes without exception. And for whatever reason, it has been determined that we as individuals that interface with the banking industry, we get to earn 0% on our savings accounts. Mm. And that is a travesty. That actually changes behavior. That causes more riskiness in in society, which is not good for the society long term. Cryptocurrency, blockchain technology enables me right now to earn 6.9% on my savings account. Okay, wow. so, so people that are not utilizing it are getting 0%, and I am getting 6.9%. And that, but what about those you see like, oh, Bitcoin dropped today or something? Is this beyond Bitcoin? Of course. I mean, when I, you know, I, I don't own any Bitcoin. Okay. I actually, I'm not, I'm not interested in owning Bitcoin um, because I don't believe that it, it provides a useful function, right? And that's simple, right? Now, it, it does have some utility and some people consider it digital gold. And I would say that that's an accurate description because if you think of a, a gold, it's a piece, it's a rock, right, that sits there inanimate, and, and it doesn't provide much utility. And very much the same way I think of uh, Bitcoin. It doesn't provide a whole lot of utility. There is some, there are some use cases, but um, that's mostly just transferring wealth back and forth. And, uh, but that's it. it. It's not an interesting technology to me. I'm much more interested in Ethereum. I know. Yeah, that that's the big one. Uh, talking about Bill Stanford here for just a few more minutes. Um, I'm worried that the government wants to get its hands on the crypto community and make it centralized, you know, currency. And, and isn't there a danger we run if they do get their hands on all of this? I, I think the government should use the technology. I, I'm a big proponent of all governments. I mean, especially our government, but all governments should be using this technology. It's it's a great technology. And the main reason that we should put the U.S. dollar as a, as a crypto, right? We should we should um, digitize the the U.S. dollar is so that we American citizens can hold our government accountable for its spending. I mean, that's one of the that's one of the beauties of of a cryptocurrency is that it's incredibly transparent. And in its account, it's literally accounting software that tells you. So you, if you wanted to find out how much the government spent on toilet paper in Anchorage, Alaska, you could do that in two seconds. So you're saying we could print a bank statement out whenever they raise the debt ceiling is what you're telling me, basically. Well, actually, you know, it, it, there, there's, there's a bunch of arguments. I mean, one of the biggest problems with our monetary system right now is that it's pretty much unaccountable by unelected officials that can determine how much they're going to increase the monet the the M2 the monetary flow right i mean that's that's a huge issue that is actually what's causing inflation and i don't think that that's that is that should be legal i don't think we should our government should just be allowed to inflate our currency that's our money yep and and by the way i know that inflation's hitting everybody's pocket uh, and gas is up again this Memorial Day, and then they're just the answer seems to be, "We'll give you more relief. We're not going to fix the issue. We're going to give you more relief," and that doesn't work either. Of course not. It's actually it, it is it is adding problems on top of problems, and this this issue of inflation is incredibly simple. It, it is incredibly simple for anybody out there. I mean, all you have to do is increase the production of energy domestically. Right. It, it, this is the law, and again, it's called a law for a reason, right? It's the law of supply and demand, right? So we have to increase the supply of energy, right? And that'll drive the price of energy down, which will decrease inflation, right? I mean, yeah. straight out. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that while I'm a proponent of all these futuristic technologies and energy, such as solar, um, we really need to focus on building more nuclear plants, using more natural gas, drilling more oil. The mm. all of the above strategy is what's necessary 
in order to get us out of this inflation cycle. And the Democrats are simply not going to do it. So as long as Democrats in, are in power, you can expect prices to continue to rise. Well, and that's that's a scary thing. I mean, they're allowing Russia to build a pipeline, but ours are canceled every damn minute. And it's just, it, it makes no that, sense. That is a great point right there, is that they know very well that China is building coal plants, Russia is building oil, and, and so they can say, see, these are bad people. But it, it, for anybody that's an environmentalist, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We, we're the cleanest energy producer on the planet, and we're the most efficient. We should be producing the world's energy. We are cleaner, we're more efficient, and it, it, is, it, it strengthens freedom across the planet. It is the number one issue of our day. Texas used to be the third in the world at one point. So there was that. Hey, I got to ask you about CD, uh, your congressional district that you ran in. Any updates there? Are the Republicans having any shot at taking a house there? How seat? Well, so, so, I mean, it, it's fascinating what happened in CD4 when I was running. And, and again, they, the powers that be were more than happy to, to let me run against Kathleen Rice, um, who was who was or is the sitting congresswoman of CD4? But when she when she decided that she was not going to run, that was really um, the end of my chances. And they were going to the the powers that be were going to put in um, you know a machine politician, which they which they have done. Um, but the the redistricting that the Democrats. Mm -hmm gerrymandering that the Democrats took on um, was deemed unconstitutional in the state of New York and went to the courts. And the courts said that there needed to be a, a special master appointed to do the redistricting. The new maps just came out last week. And CD4, this district, went from um, a D plus four, which is the registration of Democrats over Republicans. And D plus four is, you know, 5248, something along those sure. lines. It's now a D10, okay? No, so, wow. And, and so wow. This, this was, I got very lucky. And, uh, and I'm very grateful that I'm not running right now. Well, I feel like you're a guy that follows your instincts. So that's why you bowed out when you did. And, and now you're working on other projects, which is great. My final question to you as someone who did much of the Memorial Day Parade, someone who loves America, someone who's very much within this whole society and, and trying to, fix it, move it forward for the better. Would would the fallen heroes be absolutely mortified at what's going on today? I'm going to go back to that one more time. I mean, they, they have to be rolling in their graves right now, seeing what's going on, on this uh, in this country. Well, again, I, I think that the, the one issue that really is at the forefront in my mind of a cultural, the cultural war, if you will, is the the concept of of transgenderism where there you know there's one side of the aisle the democrat party believes they actually believe that women can be men and vice versa and and that's 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 and then they on top of that they expect everybody who doesn't believe that um to participate in in their insanity um and so you know i, I don't think that again I think that there's been, um, I think that tolerance has kind of gotten a little out of control and it actually breeds some type of uh, dementia and, and some, it, it breeds some type of uh, psychological problems in, mm -hmm. in the society. So, you know, first of all, women cannot become men and, and men cannot become women. Um, and that's something that, you know, we, we have to, we as normal, normal human beings, um, we have to stand up against that type of strange and, and, and disturbing ideology. And I, I think it's very detrimental to the country to allow this, uh, this type of mentality to continue to breathe. These people are mentally ill and they deserve treatment and they deserve care. Um, they don't deserve to be ridiculed, but they also do not deserve to be accepted. Well, at Bill Stanford is his Twitter. Come back again in the next few weeks and talk about whether BET, border economy, and transgenderism has changed for you. I'd love to catch that on another episode if you're, if you're down to come back. 
I'm happy to come back anytime. Thanks uh, so much for having me. Thank you. That was Bill Stanford, a veteran and a cryptologist, and a, really become a friend over the last few months here, last couple of years, while I work at AM970 The Answer. And remember, when you're at the beach today, they storm the beaches so you could be at the beach. Have a blessed Memorial Day 2022.